we are in a study of the chapter titled man and the evolution where shri rubindo has been taking up the various objections to the evolutionary theory and dealing with them we saw last time that we can view reality in its most superficial appearance as a physical world where a physical energy mechanical unconscious is driving the whole process and then we come to certain conclusions but we do not see any obvious necessity for an evolution or even an evidence that an evolution is taking place perhaps everything is simply as it was but if we look at a layer behind we can recognize that behind this unconscious energy there is a layer of a conscious secret but conscious energy and that itself is an expression of conscious being and if there is secretly conscious energy and conscious being then their very presence will provoke an impression a result in the working of this mechanical energy and so shri rubindo through these series of layers of reality shows us the mechanism which drives evolution for the physical energy and the physical objection to evolution this is a very simple point that recognition of this underlying secret being and secret consciousness is enough to show that there is a purpose in the evolution because the truth of being what that being is and the truth of its existence must eventually reflect and act out in the workings of its consciousness and therefore of its will so he uses these two phrases the truth of conscious being that has become dynamic and set out to fulfill itself in an automatic process of material nature just the fact that there is this truth of being which is set out to work out the rest will happen as part of this automatic process and the second phrase he uses is this translation of the truth of the being into a will power in the consciousness the translation is normal and inevitable this phrase normal and inevitable has an extreme importance because once we recognize this broad framework we can see that it applies everywhere in the cosmos not just on our physical world wherever there is matter wherever there is secret consciousness whatever is an expression of the underlying divine being there has to be eventually as part of a normal process and an inevitable process the divine must reveal itself must organize itself in this working of the mechanical energy and then you link it with the previous uh, statement in the physical nature it appears like an automatic process it happens because behind it it's already there so when you look at the forms that nature throws they are all in some sense revelation in form of the thing which is present in consciousness and as truth of being every form therefore contains within it something of that truth of being and the quality of consciousness that it puts out it is that which makes form possible and it is that which form expresses in its working once you become clear of this relationship you also realize that the form is driven in its behavior in its even in its appearance of color and function by what that truth of being represents so if you look at an elephant what is the truth of being of the elephant the elephantness of elephant the quality of that consciousness the body follows not only in its form but in its movement the gait of the elephant is going to be this very 
lumbering but graceful slow movement because that's the quality it expresses in the behavior of the elephant in its relationships in its social life even in the role that it plays in the working of the forest everything will become an expression of this now when you start thinking of it in this way take it a step further every animal is functioning to express the quality of consciousness that it represents and has that functional role in the whole of nature if the full spectrum of nature the full domain of nature is complete fully expressed it must become a replica of the being which is behind and the power of consciousness that it expresses it must get fully represented here eventually so a human being could go in destroy certain species of animals break this balance break this richness but eventually that self auto self operative automatic process inevitable process will bring back something which represents that quality of consciousness and that function in the whole working of the balance of the local ecology of the forest or the planetary system or even the galactic system when you recognize this truth some of the implications are staggering if you found a planet let's say in another solar system in which life has had enough time to evolve you will find there an equivalent of the elephant species which is on earth an equivalent expression of consciousness there will be differences in details in form in specifics but something which expresses that quality and because it expresses that quality its behavior would be similar the similar kind of movement similar kind of form similar kind of function in the overall balance of the forest ecology and if you push this through to culmination you will find every planet will express in its characteristic way the fullness of what the secret being is to whatever extent its material and its circumstances can express now there will be inevitably beings which slide like the snake forms which express that snake like movement why because that is characteristic of that energy of that grade of consciousness now when you read sri aurobindo savitri where he describes ashwapati's journey through the subtle physical worlds and then through the planes of the vital mental consciousness at every stage he is describing the emergence of forms in quality of consciousness and he describes how at first there is this chaotic inchoate unindividualized grouping of consciousness almost like a bacteria and that grade of consciousness and then emergent from it sliding slithering movements and out of that emergent from it something more more organized which also is more capable of complex movement and so on he is describing in grades of consciousness but if you feel the grade of consciousness you can identify ah this corresponds to that animal on earth but it would correspond to an equivalent animal on every planet eventually so the implications of this are staggering every microcosm universe in the larger macrocosm must represent the full possibilities of the whole within its limited capacity if you just take one small part of the ecosphere we spoke of forest but look at the ocean even in the ocean you will find all of these represented so the equivalent of the sliding movement of the snake with that grade of consciousness the equivalent of the elephant movement with that grade of consciousness but now in ocean and the equivalent of all the species which you find outside water within the limitation of the ocean's capacity to express <clears throat> so this is an important part which he addresses the question purely at the level of the physical um, objection to sense of purpose and then he moves to the metaphysical objection where which says that well anyway the divine is complete why does it need to express anything why should there be an evolution or a goal of evolution and that he answers by pointing out that in the working of matter within those limitations 
the full thing is not represented while the divine is fully expressed in the totality of the cosmos anyway or within the totality of the divine consciousness within a part of that expression the full movement can attempt to express and so there can be the sense of purpose the sense of direction the sense of a goal of evolution and this is exactly what the vedic vision proposes to us the logic is very simple put in a very general way everything in the universe is trying to organize itself and express everywhere to whatever extent possible so in the vital world you will have an attempt for everything to try to organize itself in terms of the vital so in the mental world but in the physical world there is one problem which is not there anywhere else in the cosmos the physical world is a world of form and form innately binds covers up content of form so if you have a box you can describe the shape of the box but you cannot see its content and so when consciousness expresses itself in form in world of form consciousness is hidden it's as if lost concealed at least and so when the whole cosmos the whole spectrum of cosmic consciousness tries to organize itself in matter form blocks conceals prevents the free expression and as a result all those things which have got in here trying to express themselves are first lost inside form then through this long process of struggle they are able to push forward a little bit and a little bit each time plastifying the form making form become more and more of their character in order to express themselves and the result is an evolution and an evolutionary unfolding of powers of consciousness which were not visible in the form which were impossible to the form in itself so strictly speaking this kind of an evolution where something comes out of what was not is only taking place in the material plane all other planes because form is not the primary character form is fluid anything can easily shape form and express itself only in matter this problem exists and so the emergence of evolution and with it he gives another important uh, insight while the objection to metaphysical objection to evolution is well the divine is anyway expressing delight everywhere why does it need to express delight in a particular sequence or a sense of purpose or struggle of emergence and he puts a very simple solution there that ananda is the secret principle of all being and support of all activity but there is also an ananda of working out of a truth inherent in being and that ananda is a movement of drawing out possibilities not only draws out possibilities but that tendency to draw out is inherent in the movement of the energy itself working out inside all the working of conscious force there is this hidden awareness and the joy of drawing out possibilities and with this the whole sense of purpose the whole sense of direction of evolution has now been established all objections against it have been taken care of now sri arbindo moves freely to formulate what is this framework of evolution from the spiritual perspective and first step he distinguishes it from the physical evolution and the scientific concept of evolution because and we'll see this why this distinction is important a theory of spiritual evolution is not identical with a scientific theory of form evolution and physical life evolution so what we see in darwin's articulation form changes life evolves he says that's not the same thing as the spiritual evolution it must stand on its own inherent justification it may accept the scientific account of physical evolution as a support or an element but the support is not indispensable so here we are facing the proper relationship between these two things the scientific description can at best 
justify, offer some external evidence, but the basis of spiritual evolution must exist by itself. Why? Because the nature of spiritual evolution has to be dependent on spirit and not on matter. And spirit itself must have something inherent in its very movement of evolution. If at all it has a material support, well, it's as a support or as some secondary mechanism of matter that is used. But the material process should not be necessary for the spiritual. See, this relationship is very important in many respects. We will find, for example, in spiritual life, people give an exaggerated importance to physical requirements. You must eat vegetarian food. You must be celibate. You must deny yourself some things. You must suffer so that you will grow in consciousness. And if you think about it, if realization of the self requires you to be dependent on the food that you eat, then matter is surely more powerful than spirit. If spirit is first and matter is a product of spirit, it should be able to override any material compulsion or limitation. And so this is the relationship even here. If there is to be a spiritual evolution, it must exist on its own principles. Matter at best can offer a support for it. So, and the scientific theory of this, he says, the scientific theory is concerned only with the outward and visible machinery and process. But the, de but the details of nature's execution with the physical development of things in matter and the law of development of life and mind in matter. Its account of the process may have to be considerably changed or may be dropped altogether in the light of new discovery. But that will not affect the self-evident fact of a spiritual evolution. And he is even suggesting that our current understanding of evolution, however much it may be convincing to the current thinking, in the light of new evidence, it may even need to be entirely revised or even dropped. It's a suggestion, but we will see shortly how, how important that is. But the point of the physical evolutionary description is, it is only focused with the visible machinery and process of how this maps to that, that maps to the next. And all you've done is you've described what you see in what nature has done. You may put some kind of a theory that from here it could go there because the giraffe needed to eat leaves which were high enough so it had to stretch its neck. But if you think about it a little further, if the giraffe needed to do that, why didn't other animals who were also in that environment need to do that? Or why did the giraffe's neck stretch and the elephant's nose stretch to reach out the same way? What was the distinguishing character between them which made for that difference? Or why did some other creature learn to climb up rather than eating, needing to stretch out an arm in order to develop? So, at the end of the day, you can only describe things for what they appear, but explanations are never convincing in themselves. So we can formulate these appear apparent laws of development of life and mind in matter, but that's it. All of this may have to be considerably changed. Now I want to play on this a little bit in the light of some recent experiments and explorations. We have not so far seen any obvious evolutionary change in any scientific experimentation where a species is actually beginning to become some other species. We do see behavioral change. We see behavioral change transmitted. But a species actually changing, there is no evidence of that. And so the question actually comes, what makes for that? Oh, random mutation. But again, that's not an explanation. I am point to two kinds of experiments. One which was done in, I, be, I believe, 1992, where a petri dish of bacteria samples is, is exposed to a poison. The bulk of the bacteria die out, but a few survive and become now resistant to the poison. What is found is all those which have survived have had the identical genetic mutation in all of them. Now, if mutation was by random chance, cosmic rays popping something, 
then you would have had one you would not have a large number of simultaneous mutations the only conclusion in this case was for the experimenters that within the bacterial nucleus which is a single cell within that nucleus there is an intelligence which not only knows how the poison is harming it but how it must modify itself to become resistant to the poison now the level of intelligence this requires is higher than our computation power our computers can map out the genetic structure but it cannot compute in what way to modify the genetic structure to make the cell resistant to this poison we don't even understand how the genetic coding is but the cell internally knows what it needs to do and is able to do it and so you recognize that the prime drivers of evolution may utilize this kind of a destructive influence but the change which makes for the evolution has nothing to do with it it only used that as an opportunity the change involved a secret intelligence operating in cells at at the level of cells the second line of experimentation which i want to point to because it is still very fresh in my consciousness on the day before yesterday i was in a, one of the most advanced laboratories of india in the world in fact where experimentation in uh, cellular cultures animal cultures etc are taking place with the all international standards and experimentations with the most advanced machinery and procedures and they were assigned to test the effect of energy medicine healing energy on cellular cultures on animals and even later in humans and so the team was selected based on certain criteria that they were at least open to doing the experiments most of them said this is crazy we're not going to get involved but of those who accepted to do they were went with an open mind uh, organized the most strict double blind experiments because if you make one mistake your reputation will go so with all that they began to do the series of experiments mapping out 20 different parameters of cellular working so if you look at uh, the cells from the perspective of aging what are the parameters which make the cell age and can you modify those parameters what are the parameters which make for the liver function to be efficient and can you modify those parameters heart function um, digestive function gut biome etc all the key things which would be required some 20 different parameters and for each of these they made separate uh, experiments with the healer in double blind so even the experimenters didn't know where the healing had been placed where it was not placed and the healing was very targeted you have to ensure that this aging process marker in the cell is now reversed now a healer is has no consciousness of what's happening inside the cell not only is he not conscious of his own cells much less can he be conscious of another cell but when the intention is explained to him and he puts that intention in the energy that he places what they found was a dramatic increase of precisely those markers which were targeted by the healing dramatic in 40 to 80% increase and at the same time when they were told these are markers for aging which have to be reduced well 40 to 80% reduction every time targeted and reasonably consistent occasionally a healer had a bad day so they didn't get good results they said let me do it again and a second attempt had again dramatic results so of course all these attempts were collated and you have a very um, statistically significant uh, variation this was done with about 100 healers over a period of 2 years some of the healers were too busy to come so they came from all over the world some of them said sorry we cannot come uh, all the way to india but we will do our healing through skype so the scientists freaked out they said this is crazy we don't believe it's possible but they followed the, whatever the healer required so they had a notebook computer with a screen a skype call with the healer and this petri dish is placed in front of the screen and the healer concentrates and you have the result and of course this is done with double blind you have another laptop computer with petri dish with just a webcam of some nature scene or something like that 
and with all the tests they had the results were so dramatic so undeniable sometimes the scientists heading the experiments they said this is impossible please go ahead and redo it and again consistent result now what this showed and in one example that they, which they shared they were watching under the microscope neuronal cells in the culture which had just been given healing energy over a span of 1 to 2 minutes the neurons were growing the connections links with other cells you take it out of that healing energy they stopped bring it back in the healing energy they start growing again within 1 or 2 minutes there is a change in the cellular working in a way which is so dramatic now of course all of these changes were in the cellular response in the markers put out by cells in the measure of the proteins and their processes but that they could reverse aging showed something where genetic damage had taken place telomerase was shortened telomer the telomeres had been shortened telomerase levels were different all of those were reversed and that shows you pure energy operating on the physical biological process is enough to significantly modify the process so much that it goes outside the domain of its normal functioning and once you recognize the power of energy and the implied influence of the conscious intention of the energy then the whole game changes that the healer put an in- intention to boost a particular parameter and you had that result how do you explain it and the only conclusion they had was the energy is intelligent if you tell the energy i want this outcome the energy knows how to do it inside the cellular working isn't it if you link it to the earlier discussion that the bacterial uh, culture which was exposed to poison had the necessary knowledge to modify itself genetically that means in the energy is the consciousness and intelligence not in the physical working and that means an energetic intervention a consciousness behind energy intervention can even make for radical genetic changes now in this series of experiments that was not attempted it was not even looked for but they did find structural change in the cells structural change even in molecules now all of this goes to show that perhaps the mechanisms which we have so far mapped out random mutation survival of the, survival of the fittest may be only the very superficial part of the machinery and many of these explanations may have to be dropped and that's why he says its account of the process may have to be considerably changed or may be dropped altogether in the light of new discovery but that will not affect the self evident fact of a spiritual evolution so literally he is suggesting even if you discard almost entirely the physical narration of the evolutionary process <coughs> the fact of spiritual evolution will remain and what is that an evolution of consciousness a progression of the soul's manifestation in material existence so first consciousness grows at the level of let's say a single individual at the level of a pack a family of animals at the level of an entire species and for the soul's manifestation in material existence there is a progression there are a series of steps and the interesting part of the steps is the highest of one step well crosses over the lowest of the previous step so in consciousness terms there is a significant overlap to take the example of a monkey from the monkey from the ape to the human the most intelligent ape often crosses in intel in intelligence the least intelligent of the human being so it shows in consciousness terms there is enough overlap that you could go from ape body to human body through rebirth and still have lots of play for uh, development of grade of consciousness but there is as if an ascending scale which has been prepared with enough overlap between each step of the scale to allow for the soul to manifest in a series 
in its outward aspects this is what the theory of evolution comes to now he's summarizing there is always seen from outside there is in the scale of terrestrial existence a development of forms of bodies a progressively complex and competent organization of matter of life in matter of consciousness in living matter this is part 1 of the description part 2 of the description in this scale the better organized the form the more it is capable of housing a better organized a more complex and capable a more developed or evolved life and consciousness so the first part is describing the appearance the second part is describing what it expresses through this change of appearance but this is what it appears when you look from outside at evolution first there is a scale of terrestrial existence of development of forms all wording is very precise you could have a non terrestrial existence of forms they could all be in the subtle world in the subtle gradations that's not the point of evolution there is in the physical material substance gradations but then he says development of forms of bodies because at a certain level low enough you cannot call it body anymore so perhaps in clusters of cells you could call it a body but is a single cell a body or if you drop further into the mineral domain you cannot call it body anymore you can only say form is becoming more complex so forms and bodies are developing progressively complex and competent organization so complexity is not enough there is also competence it is more adapted more adjusted more capable of utilizing its circumstances so if you remain for example within the ocean you will find competence means you can better utilize the circumstances of the ocean if you go deep enough in the ocean where there is lava emerging at the base of the ocean where there is no sunlight there is no oxygen and the lava is emerging with sulfurous poisonous uh, heavy metals and fumes and at very hot uh, levels where water is almost boiling you will find there not only bacteria but also worms and even small fish which are adapted to that environment in that small uh, miniature universe bit by bit it's as if evolution is pushing forward to increased complexity but increased capability so if you had bacteria they are less capable if you have worms they are more capable fish now are even more capable so this distinction is important complexity is not enough competence is also there of matter and then of life in matter of consciousness in living matter all three are still in the domain of matter that's where evolution has to take place but the wording is suggestive life is in matter the life form is bound to the material process and similarly the consciousness is bound to the living matter so these three gradations shurbindo will keep repeating in all his examples throughout when he describes life uh, when he describes evolution and out of that consciousness in living matter will be gradations of consciousness and then better organize the form the more it is capable of housing a better organized a more complex and capable a more developed or evolved life and consciousness so now mapping the forms complexity with the complexity of life and complexity of consciousness which is growing in it now this is the picture he offers from the external perspective this is the theory of evolution what it comes to once the evolutionary hypothesis is put forward and the facts supporting it are marshaled this aspect of the terrestrial existence becomes so striking as to appear indisputable so when darwin came out with it and placed all the data drew the tree of life and all the forms it is so obvious people had to say well yes 
although the religion says no but the evidence is so overwhelming the precise machinery by which this is done or the exact genealogy or chronological succession of types of being is a secondary though in itself an interesting and important question and you will see even today in the big tree which is drawn of the evolutionary genealogy of types there are still some doubts some creatures could come from this branch or from that branch or perhaps even that they emerged independently from two different branches appearing to become almost identical in their type and we see this for example in certain functional developments for example of the eye there are independent passages in the branch which develop the eye but which ends up with almost similar similar organization of the eye although with different originations so these are details you can dispute the development of one form of life out of a precedent less evolved form natural selection the struggle for life the survival of acquired characteristics may or may not be accepted this is this is the explanation given in the darwinian process we'll look at these again but the fact of successive creation with a developing plan in it is the one conclusion which is of primary importance you have to accept there is some kind of developing plan and succession but what is the mechanism offered in the explanation first one life emerges out of a less evolved previous life form is that true we can dispute it natural selection because one life form has developed special characteristics it can better survive and something which is less survivable fades out again we can dispute it you see in the human uh, selection process which is more complex than a natural selection process in natural selection you look at um, animals ability to simply survive because of food or uh, other environmental circumstances but what is not taken into account so obviously is what makes for the selection of a particular individual from the species so among animals often they will say the stronger male dominates the weaker male and so over time the males become stronger but in the human domain it can be much more complex it is not always strength wealth also makes a big difference people are attracted to wealth and are willing to compromise strength for wealth or for intelligence or for skill or for affinity of types which we see also very interesting in the human species someone who has a physical defect from birth may not find a mate who is fully healthy rarely it happens though because of strong emotional attraction or bond of love but otherwise they will generally settle with someone who has some other type of physical deficiency and so they both compromise to some degree but that does not lead to progeny which is phys- physically defective it does not lead to specialization of the type so natural selection itself can be questioned especially in the more complex development of forms and the struggle for life being the prime driver and this is one of the problems which modern uh, um, scientific or darwinian evolution has brought that life itself is a giant scramble that you have to be fighting and only the most fit is going to survive and the least fit is automatically eliminated or must be eliminated for evolution to progress so as a logic it can be compelling but does it match the evidence we see spaces in nature where there is a survival struggle but we we'll, we also see spaces of nature where there is excess of everything there is no obvious survival struggle and yet there is evolution in fact more rich evolution where there is obvious survival struggle the variations are less in fact so we can question this factor also and the fourth is the survival of acquired characteristics 
that whatever you have inherited because your parents had it in common that is what survives because it was the common inheritance and again in the example i've given earlier just because there's a community of people who are of a certain type it does not always lead to that type being inherited but the one thing remaining is this fact of successive creation and a developing plan and the plan can be this full tree this full complexity of unfolding another self evident conclusion is that there is a graduated necessary succession in the evolution first the evolution of matter next the evolution of life in matter then the evolution of mind in living matter and in this last stage an animal evolution followed by human evolution so this is graded there are fine steps all through and necessary succession after this there has to be something which is more complex if you look at the sequence of evolution you do not see something less complex emerging out of more complex from the ape you do not see something less complex dropping dropping out of it this may seem obvious when we read or when you look at the evidence but it's not so obvious when you actually try to simulate ev- evolution we have for example the advantage today with computers to program an eco- ecosystem and it can be done in many different ways you can program any set of laws for change for mating for survival for development of characteristics and for struggle between them program any li- kind of laws and see what comes you can actually run a million years of evolution well within a few hours with enough computing power what is interesting is in all the programming laws that have been placed inevitably you find after a while a simple aggressive type emerges which destroys everything else you do not see increase of diversity or at best the diversity increases until it becomes chaotic unsustainable and meaningless the idea that a richer form emerges and stays stable and then out of that a richer form stays stable and nothing of the previous is destroyed and nothing regresses is impossible to replicate with whatever combination of forms you create we can create very interesting and rich structures but at the end of the day this does not happen either there is one simple form which overwhelms everything else or it gets into some kind of a monotony which continues to repeat itself no more enriching any and stops there and so it shows you that rationally based evolution with logic with structure however complex does not get to this result this implies something more profound which has an intention for complexity and forward movement and so this is what he is encapsulated in this description and of this five stages he describes which are unavoidable and visible first the evolution of matter he doesn't say in matter of matter matter itself has to evolve to become more and more complex so in this you see first the elements starting from the basic hydrogen all the way through to more complex the most complex and often unstable uranium and so on so we have almost more than 100 elements which have been mapped out this is only elemental evolution within each element there is the evolution of isotopes variations within that element and then across these elements complex interactions which create complex molecules made up of combinations of these which have still more unusual properties and out of that minerals and evolution of minerals and different kinds of crystalline structures and out of that compounds of these minerals again having a complex evolution so if you take a grain of sand it's not one flat mineral it's many minerals which have formed to fa- create a compound with specific characteristics and so on so there is this huge preparation of the base of matter and if this was not done then life in matter would not be possible because it needs this sufficiently rich base 
if you go to a planet let's say now we are uh, space explorers we are visiting planets to see and explore life and intelligence if you see a planet in which this full spectrum of physical evolution has not gone rich enough you can straight away say we cannot have bacteria surviving here just for bacteria as single celled basic creatures to survive they would need a sufficiently complex mineral base to have evolved so only when that is done next the evolution of life and matter and that of course we have seen in the examples of the progression and then in that the evolution of mind in living matter so again the suggestion is this if life needs sufficient base of matter to have evolved so to mind needs a sufficient base of life to have evolved mind cannot for example house itself in a single cell why because the working of mind is so complex it can never be represented in something that is so simple if you take a worm which has let's say about a few hundred neurons the brain structure of the worm is too simple for conscious mind to organize itself yes mental consciousness can express itself but a conscious individualized mind cannot express itself through that so we do see for example the ability to train a worm to behave and so consciousness is modified we can see cockroaches which can be trained into pretty complex things i believe cockroaches have 400 neurons in their brain so that's still too simplistic there's an individualized consciousness but not self awareness of mind possible in fact there are things there which are unexplainable as as an example i i give this experiment where a cockroach is taught to go through a maze now wandering through a maze to get to food is very complex behavior it must remember all the turns it must make a series of turns it must remember where it is and know which turn now is before you because all turns look similar it must know it has completed a previous turn and now is in the next turn so it requires a pretty complex level of behavior but a cockroach can be taught that once it has been taught and this is the crazy part of the experiment if you cut off its head and join it to another cockroach which has never been in this maze so that they share the blood this new cockroach with shared blood now knows to navigate the maze the implication is that the knowledge of navigating the maze was not bound to the neurons of the brain which have been removed it was held in the full consciousness of the cockroach and so with the blood is shared with the consciousness of the next cockroach you see this implication is so extraordinary it means that this complex behavior was not dependent on the small number of neurons but was held in the overall consciousness the small number of neurons only were a mechanism to translate the intention of this consciousness into the biology and so you realize that the neuronal base becoming more complex allows for a more complex consciousness to translate its intentions but still that's not enough to have individualized consciousness experience you can have complex behavior but individualization would require a base of neurons so complex it can hold self awareness internally within the neuronal structure and that's why life forms have to evolve to become of a sufficient grade of internal complexity before you have that individualized mind so then only this sequence can come so the idea here he is giving is there has to be first this evolution then that then the other you cannot have steps being jumped it's not possible after that though he gives two more steps and in the last stage once you have uh, evolution of mind in living matter in this last stage an animal evolution followed by human evolution now straight away these two steps we can doubt whether it is necessary to have one before the other all these earlier stages it is obvious necessary but is this necessary he addresses this question the first three terms of the succession are too evident to be disputable it may be debated whether there was a succession of man to animal 
और साइमल्टेनियस इनिशियल डेवलपमेंट मैन आउटस्ट्रिपिंग द एनिमल इन माइंड एवोल्यूशन दिस वी कैन डिस्कस मे बी इन द एनिमल एवोल्यूशन देर वॉज द ह्यूमन टाइप एंड द एनिमल टाइप एट द सेम टाइम बोथ कंटिन्यूड एंड द एनिमल कुड नॉट गो बियॉन्ड द पॉइंट एंड द ह्यूमन कंटिन्यूड फर्दर इन टू माइंड एवोल्यूशन लॉजिकली पॉसिबल सो ही हैज टू एंश्योर एवरी पॉसिबिलिटी इज एड्रेस्ड and in fact this possibility is suggested many times and you will see it addresses certain need a theory has even been put forward that man was not the last but the first and eldest of the animal species so there is this theory that says man precisely is more conscious because it has had a head start so it would have existed even at the time of the dinosaurs and crocodiles and all other animals which existed but because we have been longer around we have had more time to develop into conscious intelligence others haven't been long enough this priority man this priority of man is an ancient conception but it was not universal it is born of the sense of the clear supremacy of man among earthly creatures the dignity of the this supremacy seeming to demand a priority of birth interesting idea that because there is something so special here it should have been always there from the beginning in the biblical tradition there is this idea that in the garden of eden well they were always there and of course they were sent driven out from eden into the earth zone but the animals there are placed by god before adam and adam is given the chance to name them and to look after them so the idea of a stewardship that you are supposed to look after the others because you are superior because you have greater intelligence and dignity and place you should make sure that they are kept in order and look after them this is the sense of that dignity and supremacy demanding a priority of birth but in evolutionary fact the superior is not prior but posterior in appearance the less developed precedes the more developed and prepares it so in our conception of things we would want it to be like that but in the fact of evolution it's the opposite there is even in the theosophical literature a very interesting suggestion where they speak of the human being being present all along from the beginning but not in a materialized body in a subtle body which became progressively more and more materialized so while the animal evolution was developing the human being was present in subtle form once the animal evolution reached a certain stage the human beings could materialize enough now to be able to as if take over from there and perhaps by joining into the animal body or by simply materialization that detail is not obvious and in fact he will address that question also later how exactly can the human emerge out of the animal if at all that process is required he will be addressing it later on in fact he says the idea of the priority of the lower form of life is not altogether absent in ancient thinking now he goes into certain traditions he gives the example in india of the favor favorance of priority of animal over man and which is similar to the modern conception and there is an upanishad he declares an upanishad declares that the self or spirit after deciding on life creation first formed animal kinds like the cow the horse but the gods who are in the thought of the upanishads powers of consciousness and powers of nature found them to be insufficient vehicles so in the text of the upanishad successively these animals appear and the gods look and they say ah this is not good enough then the next animal appears created by the spirit and the god said no this is not good enough and the spirit finally created the form of man which the gods saw to be excellently made and sufficient and they rushed into and they entered into it for their cosmic functions so the description actually goes when finally the human type is created the gods rush in 
and settle into it. And and the Upanishadic text describes where each of the gods is seated. And so they describe the psychological functions within the human body. Now this idea is profound. It's not just a parable. It has a deeper spiritual and symbolic significance. Uh, with this, in the sense that, remember, if every individual or every unit is a symbol of the cosmos, then the working of the cosmic deities also have to be represented within us. In the same relation that they have in the cosmic working, they have the same relation within us in their functioning. So the human being has to become as if in the relationship of powers of consciousness, a symbol of the cosmos. Now, again, this being a universal principle, any planet, any species of intelligent being, once it has evolved enough, will have a similar mapping of the functions of consciousness. But all inferior species, being not as complete in their expression, would have a similar mapping but with reduced functionalities. Some powers less evolved, some powers non-existent as if not expressed or not evolved and so on. So successively in the sequence, more and more of these workings of powers grow, but the overall template would be similar in their interrelation between each other. The importance of this is great because in certain practices, especially in certain uh, psychological rituals and occult practices, they tap into these parts of the body for that function, for that power of consciousness. So there's one particular ritual you will still see present in some temples or some houses which are very traditional in India, where they will bring a cow to the house and the cow being the most sattvic animal in consciousness, in purity and clarity, well, its presence itself brings that vibration but within the cow, the part of the cow which most manifests the consciousness of Lakshmi, harmonization and production, bringing, bringing forth plenty, that part is the hind region of the cow. It's the part from where the cow gives its milk. And if you look at the overall functioning of the cow, the way it is most able to physically share its sattvic quality is through the milk that it gives. And all of that generation is taking place in the hind part of the cow. Equally, it is one of the few creatures that all of its waste material, including its urine and its feces, are all healthy. Not just healthy for the human beings, they are healthy for the entire environment. There is nothing in them which is harmful. In fact, the bacteria which the cows put, puts out are all probiotic. They all prevent diseases, they all increase immunity and strengthen health. So it's as if that part of the body of the cow has this very strong imprint of a grade of consciousness and all the functions and all the products from that part are impressed with that. So in the ritual, they bring the cow and then they light the lamp and then they worship the hind part of the cow's body where Lakshmi is most strongly present. And if you think of it in these terms, every animal will have similarly certain functions, certain qualities of consciousness highlighted in certain parts of their body and their working. But in the human being, it's as if all the powers are represented, all are present. And according to our human evolution, some of those are more developed, some of them, those are less, some of them are more integrated, some less, according to our evolution. And so all of human evolution could be mapped to how effective is the functioning of the gods within us and how integrated are they among themselves in their function within us. If you start looking at the human being in this way, the Vedic method of yoga becomes obvious. Consciously invoke the gods in you. Consciously amplify their working in you. Consciously integrate their functions within you. And the practical result will be your evolution of consciousness. Not only that, there is also this interesting idea that just as you are fulfilled in your growth by the gods growing in you, 
the gods are fulfilled in their growth by your growing in them so we both support each other nourish each other in our growth the gods functions are most fulfilled when they can materially express their powers in the domain of matter where they are least allowed because of that limitation of form they freely exercise themselves in the cosmos but in matter they have to struggle and in matter their access to expression in matter is through the human being or through the conscious being so the more we grow in them the more they grow in us we grow but also they grow in their cosmic function and so the whole mechanism the framework of the vedic yoga is done like this so these parables have a very deep not only truth but also implication for our understanding of evolution so he says this is a clear parable of the creation of more and more developed forms till one was found that was capable of housing a developed consciousness there is another which he does not mention here which is the concept of the 10 avatars each avatar successively represents a new grade of consciousness and the suggestion is that before that avatar comes that grade of consciousness did not exist or was not possible for nature to develop on her own and so the avatar comes to establish that and assist nature in making the transition after which once that form and consciousness are stably set the avatar withdraws and nature continues the progression so the first of these in sequence is the fish then the tortoise who is half in water half on land then there is the wild boar which represents the animal type then from there comes the half animal half human narasimha half lion and the top half is uh, uh, is the lion and the lower half is the human again suggesting that the full human expression has not taken place the head is still of the lion and after that is the proper human evolution where you have the dwarf human physical man and then comes the vital human parshurama who is the vital man and after that the satvik mind in rama what we call civilization today strictly speaking begins or its values begin from the satvik mind anything before that although human although expressing intelligence we would still call barbaric the refined human begins from the satvik mind which rama establishes and with it all the standards of satvik conduct and conduct worthy of humanity now the imprint the importance of this is so great if not for the avatar coming and imprinting this on humanity even today the semi human barbaric human would say what do i care for these values why should i put up with these values i am happy as i am but because of the imprint that is created by the avatar the barbarian looks towards the satvik values and says i feel somehow inferior if i don't live up to it he may still struggle to reach it but the fact that he views it as an ideal is the result of that avataric uh, incarnation and then after that only you have uh, shri krishna who brings a still higher grade of possibility of consciousness of which some of the characteristics are organized such as the movement of bhakti of the heart turned to god with love and even the path of the bhakti yoga comes with him which was not there as a path of yoga before and he creates these but the consciousness which he brings is still not fully accessible to the human although the human looks towards it as an ideal and only after that comes the supramental avatar but here you see clearly the gradations of consciousness mapped out but sri aurobindo now goes to into another uh, parable where the gradations are described not in terms of their function or level of consciousness like this but in terms of quality of consciousness there is a cre- clear parable of the creation of more and more no this is a clear parable of creation of more and more and more developed forms in the puranas it is stated that the tamasic animal creation was the first in time 
Tamas is the Indian word for the principle of inertia of consciousness and force. A consciousness dull and sluggish and incompetent in its play is said to be tamasic. So that's what the animal represent, of course, compared to the human. A force, a life energy that is indolent and limited in its capacity, bound to a narrow range of instinctive impulses, not developing, not seeking farther, not urged to a greater kinetic action or a more luminously conscious action, would be assigned to the same category. Now, it's not just the physical inertia, but the character of a developed, let's say, a mental consciousness, awareness, which is always bound into its narrowness and unable to push forward, has no need or urge. You'll see the difference in two human types. Two children, maybe with similar upbringing, faced with a crisis. One shrinks back in fear and waits for the crisis to pass. Another may still experience fear, but seizes upon the crisis to try to overcome, to oppose, to destroy, or to prevent its recurrence. The first is the tamasic type, shrinking into its safe space. The second could be rajasic or sattvic, depending on the kind of response which it makes. The animal in whom there is this less developed force of consciousness, is prior in creation. The more developed human consciousness in which there is a greater force of kinetic mind energy or light of perception is a later creation. The Tantra speaks of a soul fallen from its status passing through many lakhs of births in plant and animal forms before it can reach the human level and be ready for salvation. So he's giving examples of how in very ancient traditions this idea exists, that the human being comes as a culmination of these sequences. Here again, there is implied the conception of vegetable and animal life forms as the lower steps of a ladder, humanity as the last or culminating development of the conscious being. The form which the soul has to inhabit in order to be capable of the spiritual motive and a spiritual issue out of mentality, life and physicality. So this is the unique characteristic of the human. Once in the human body, you are actually capable of conceiving that there is a spiritual motive or a spiritual step beyond mentality. The drive for that also arises in the human. In the ape, you can see many complex intelligent behavior, but the sense of wanting to grow into the spiritual or to grow beyond the mind, that sense consciously felt is possible only the human type. The ape may have the sense of the sacred. It may be attracted to the sacred, but it does not have the conscious sense of being able to grow out of itself into that. So think of this as the one characteristic which is available only to the human beings. And this makes the human life so precious. This is indeed the normal conception and it recommends itself so strongly both to reason and intuition that it hardly needs debate. The conclusion is almost unescapable. Almost. But you can still avoid it and he'll touch upon that shortly. What you have here is evidence to reason and intuition. You will recall Sri Aurobindo speaks of three kinds of evidence. The evidence of the experience. Is this water? I drink it. Yes, it's water. There is the evidence of reason. It looks like water. It smells like water. Tastes like water. It must be water. And then there is the evidence of intuition, which directly bypasses the appearances. So here he has tapped into these. Reason and intuition are both satisfied. We are almost able to move ahead. 
But with this now, we are ready to explore the whole human domain of evolution. Having set all this base, having set all this base which brings us to where we are, what's happening in the human? And there are two questions. How did we come out from the animal if at all we came out from the animal? And then what happens further in the human evolution itself which is unique to the human? And all of this he will go into in fine detail and you will see how each of these will point to how the next step is to take place. So always the purpose of the Sri Aurobindo's writing is not only to understand what came before but what of that is essential for the next? What of that can be modified or even discarded for the next? And if there is some common principle, in what form it has to take place in the next? So this is now the direction of the rest of the chapter, of which we will begin the first part uh, immediately. It is against this background of a developing evolutionary process that we have to look at man. His origin and first appearance, his status in the manifestation. So where did we come from? What is our, what was that first mechanism of appearance? And what is our place in the whole working? Now remember, all this discussion is not limited to our physical earth. It's limited, it's, it covers all appearance of conscious mind in the universe, on any planet, in any life form. Now, if on some planet, the primary surface was water, with very little of land available, then perhaps the developing mental intelligence may still happen in a water body. In another land, in another planet, it could be through some other kind of species that the mind emerges and so on. But the principles he will speak of will be common across all of them. So, there are here two possibilities. Either there was the sudden appearance of a human body and consciousness in the earth's nature, an abrupt creation or independent automatic manifestation of reasoning mentality in the material world, intervening upon a previous similar manifestation of subconscious life forms and of living conscious bodies in matter. Or else, there was an evolution of humanity out of animal being. Slow perhaps in its preparation and in its stages of development, but with strong leaps of change at the decisive points of transition. Between these two, he says this latter theory offers no difficulty. And that's pretty much close to what modern scientific Darwinian evolution would have us believe. But the first one is important because there he describes another possibility which could also have been and as we will see like, uh, later has a truth and can happen equally. So either there was a sudden appearance of the human body and consciousness in the earth nature, an abrupt creation or there was that gradual emergence from a previous type. But if there is a sudden ab appearance, it can happen how? Either out of the blue it appears, or independent automatic manifestation of reasoning mentality in the material world intervening upon a previous similar manifestation of subconscious life forms and living conscious bodies. So it's as if the intelligence just appears into it, takes an existing life form and intelligence just comes. It didn't emerge out of something, it just came into it. If you take animals which have been exposed to human beings, you will see something of this process happening. That's why this description is so important. In fact, it is one of the mechanisms of evolution. We have now dogs which have lived with human beings going back many hundred years. If the human beings relate to them at a certain level of intelligence, if there is enough interchange of the human consciousness with the dog, that the human mind intelligence patterns impress themselves into the dog, 
then actually this dog species can rapidly grow into some kind of reasoning power because it acquires it directly from the human. But suppose the human was not there, a similar process could have taken place. Independent automatic manifestation or an abrupt creation. It came just like that. How? So we have stories, of course, in the Mahabharata, you have Draupadi who emerges out of the fire fully formed. She has no parentage. She is not born from somebody. We have in the Ramayana's uh, Sita who appears out of the ground somehow. And so she is daughter of Mother Earth. But these stories are not merely uh, symbolic. They have a physical basis also. And I mentioned earlier the theosophical description of the human type being present in subtle form and then materializing. If there is such a mechanism possible, and we know that it is, we can materialize physical objects, not just uh, uh, metal, metallic, but even living things. You can materialize simple life forms. It's interesting to see when these simple life forms are materialized, they do not often, they do not have reproductive organs. They do not have a developed mechanism for feeding. So even if they are materialized, they stay for a while and either they die out because they cannot eat or they don't reproduce and they fade away. And these have been done. They are beings or creatures from the vital world or the subtle physical, somewhere very close to the material domain. By an occult process, they can be materialized and they are there as creatures. It's as simple as that. Why cannot the same mechanism be used for the human? It could be. One could conceive of it. So, abrupt creation, he doesn't discuss how. Just like that it came or independent automatic manifestation of a reasoning faculty. Or else, there is this evolution out of animal being. How would that take place? First, it will have to be slow. Slow perhaps in its preparation and its stages of development. So, a little bit is gathering material slowly over time. So, it's as if one part of the species acquires some capacity gradually. And then, strong leaps of change at the decisive points of the transition. So there may be not one point of transition, there could be many points of transition. But in each of those points, there can be this sudden jump. So the idea of a slow preparation building and then a sudden leap is what he points to here. Again, this we see in, uh, of course, in the human evolution itself, for example when a new power emerges in us, such as the power of uh, self-aware conscious intelligence, which is not so organized, let's say, before teenage. It's there, but as a secondary power, and it comes forward and the rational thinking becomes suddenly active. You see it building, you see it developing its powers, and then suddenly it comes into and it says, I am a separate unit asserts itself and pushes back violently to cut off from the support structures which were so far needed. But a similar process can take place even in the physical evolution of the animal. Mother speaks of the ape transition from ape to human, a few suddenly making a radical jump and then the link breaks away. And this is what he is pointing to here. The latter theory offers no difficulty, for it is certain that changes of characteristics in the type, though not the fundamental type itself, can be brought about in species or genus. Indeed, this has already been done by man himself and its possibilities are being strikingly worked out on a small scale by experimental science. And it may fairly be assumed that the secretly conscious energy in nature could effect large-scale operations of the kind and bring about considerable and decisive developments by means of its own creative conventions. So here's the part of how this would happen, the slow change with decisive steps. And so he gives as evidence what we are doing with plants and with animals. We are able to breed specialized types of any plant 
to amplify special characteristics, with flowers to change colors, to change sizes, with fruits similarly to change flavors, colors, sizes, and even shapes. So none of this requires in itself a genetic intervention, just by crossbreeding types. But with genetic intervention, you can do the same thing even more radically with even bigger leaps. In Japan, currently, there's an attempt to create tomatoes which are cube-shaped because it's easy to package and ship. But the actual growth of the tomato on the stem of the plant will become cubic. Now, if you think about what it implies, the tomato is an expression of a quality of consciousness. Of course, there is a radical change in consciousness as a result if it is going to be cubical. Either it means its free play is stunted or it means a different quality of consciousness now coming forward. Either way. But we are able to do that in a single intervention or with, within a short few steps of two or three generations. There used to be one, sign, one uh, agriculturist in the United States. If I remember right, his name slips my mind now. But he is the one who brought about a revolution in uh, the growth of many specialized types of plants. What he would do is he would plant several hundreds of a species. And as soon as they had sprouted, he would walk among them and take out some. He knew which of them didn't have the characteristic that he wanted. And those which survived had a special characteristic. He could sense it. And those out of those, he would make another modification and extract from it a new variation. And within two generations, and the plant is not even fully grown, it's just enough to reproduce itself. He had extracted a specialized capability. He was able to create dwarf-sized plants uh, which gave fruits, although they were smaller in height, or bring about intensification of certain qualities in the fruit. Uh, with peanuts, intensification of oil content, intensification of taste, and so on. He's the one who also worked with a rose bush and was able to convince the rose bush not to have thorns, purely by intervention of his consciousness. Reaching into the consciousness of the rose bush, he found the thorns were its means of protecting itself. And so he told the bush, don't worry, I will protect you. You don't need thorns. And he continued this exercise of imprinting this until the bush was able to grow from the beginning without any thorns emerging. And it was there. And once the habit was set, out of this you can build a new species of rose plant without thorns. Direct intervention of consciousness to shape something, but also when putting an intention in a large group, weeding out quickly those which had not caught it, and so isolating one type. Now all of these are possible mechanisms of rapid intervention. And if we can do it with consciousness or energetic intervention, why can't nature do it? If we can do it by crossbreeding, why can't nature also crossbreed? And she's doing it all the time. So here what he says is whatever the human mind could do as a means of intervention, the secretly conscious energy in nature could affect also, except she has an advantage. While we can do it in our small experimental patch or in the laboratory where we graft one plant with another or intervene genetically, nature can bring that push of energetic change in a mass across the whole earth if she wants, just like that overnight large-scale operation. Nature could effect large-scale operations of the kind and bring about considerable and decisive developments by means of its own creative conventions. Now this would mean that in a very short time across the earth you would see sudden changes. The evidence for this exists. What we find in the archaeological evidence is that every time there has been a major extinction event, soon after there is a sudden efflorescence of many types and they stabilize and after that they don't become more rich. But that initial burst of many rich variations of species, plants and animals takes place in a very short time 
in evolutionary terms until it stabilizes so nature has within her the power to push in her impulse of energy to make a sudden outbreak or even to allow a collapse what we are seeing today and this is the interesting phase of evolution on one part there is the extinction event of a collapse of ecosystems and another part in part through human beings in part through nature's own responses a bursting out of variations a lot of it is seen through human beings because we seem to be interfering everywhere but um, the spread of specialized colors of flowers and shapes unfortunately many of these are negative in the fruits which we are growing today they are grown for speed and for rigidity not softness or taste or flavor and so we have undone a lot of things which nature worked upon there has been a monoculture and so reduction of variety of species and this is obvious in the human intervention space but if you go into the rainforests we see this bursting out of rich diversities still taking place and so both things are happening now and in this passage there is something else more interesting which you find mentioned in a letter of sri rubindo a sadhak asks him here is this intuition so he asks sri rubindo is it correct to say that nature is now using the human mind as her way of intervening and accelerating her own growth and sri rubindo says yes this is how it is happening and so this part is fascinating to observe in the human mind an urge appears what if we could do this what if we could amplify this color or this quality what if we can make this plant which lives only in cold cold climates adapted to warm climates or the reverse take a plant adapted to warm and take it to the cold and every time the impulse comes we think it's our creativity not realizing it's nature who's pushing within us that urge to experiment and to push some of these developments i remember narad explaining to us how in the early days of oroville they brought many plants not all of them were suited to this climate but were necessary for the gardens they were planning for matre mandir and it took them time to coax the plant to adapt to this climate here but once the plant had adapted it is as if the progeny of that plant could now stay in this environment although naturally suited to other environments at some point many of those plants were lost they were destroyed because of storms or human stupidity but the point was you could do this and nature is cooperating it would not have worked if nature had said no i'm not interested in this experiment so what you if you look deeply you realize nature is pushing the human mind to do something on the other side inside the plant she is providing the cooperative impulse to help speed up this part is the most important for us and we will pause with this idea subsequently he takes up uh, the other processes of how the consciousness works in the material intervention and uh, also that idea of the direct appearance also of the mental consciousness we'll study that next sunday but this is the important idea for us now mother spoke of it in the 1960s that mother nature has decided to collaborate in the new creation and she gave a beautiful message there um, which said there is no end to the wonders of this collaboration this the phrase was there's no end to the wonders meaning because of that collaboration of nature if human beings now begin to take a positive direction to push forward certain possibilities nature will support on the other side and what you could potentially do is limitless no end to the wonders this was part of the work that the mother had initiated in the ashram and she wanted also uh, to extend it and flower out in oroville Uh, in the field of in the relationship with plants this was obvious in the way she taught parichanda who was in charge of the gardens of uh, the ashram to relate to the plants to enter in contact in consciousness with the plants and 
those of you who have had con- uh, occasion to meet him you could see he was a person of such deep compassion he would move and feel the plant as if it was a conscious child tender and relate to it with such subtlety that kind of culturing she actually taught made people conscious of what was necessary in several of the gardens of the ashram which are now replaced by big housing buildings housing blocks all around us here uh, she had the people looking after those gardens trained by her showed them how to care for the plants help them to grow uh, certain species of flowers and so on and in oroville of course she set the same framework for the nursery which was to become the base for the gardens of matra mandir and so all of this was one part of the work there was the other side of the work which is nature's collaboration in other processes not just the plants and this was with animals she had a few cats she also experimented briefly with dogs to see if they could be helped to grow into the spiritual consciousness and could respond to the new consciousness and during the phase of that uh, work there were cats in the ashram building with her and once that phase was over she had the cats uh, removed and that ended that was the time when the supramental force was being brought into the vital consciousness and she said in her own body because that was the base of the vital consciousness there was such extraordinary youth and uh, beauty which the body was expressing and then it shifted to the physical consciousness and that took a different form so this was a second side and there was a third side which is in nature's processes when uh, they had the work being done of setting up any facility a mother intervened at the level of nature's processes and the most dramatic is when the sugar factory was being set up and they needed water they dug at many places they didn't get water and you can't have a sugar factory without enough water so she asked for the plan marked a spot and said dig there they went back as they dug they hit gushing water at one level and then gushing water at a second level and a third level now in a land where all the attempts to find water had failed in a single spot they found gushing water on three levels with so much pressure that the water was shooting out they didn't even have to put a pump and that was nature collaborating nature giving you what you asked for what mother asked for and so similar experiments one of them of course is with the weather which still functions and she explained that there's a special arrangement with the weather pattern uh, in pondicherry around the ashram that it does not rain during the working hours or if there is a storm when it has to rain continuously it will pause for at least half an hour at lunch time or at dinner time so that people can go to the dining room and barely even in the most intense rainy season we have one day or two where we have to struggle but otherwise if you wait and you know it will stop you rush through do your work and you're done but mostly what she said was there's a special arrangement that it rains at night not in the daytime and we've all seen that often intense rain at night and daytime at best something light and it's limited to this space it's not everywhere and that's an arrangement made with mother nature the point of this collaboration of course is that even today the arrangement remains mother nature is looking at these spaces where the new consciousness is being invoked where there is a strong human aspiration and it will be everywhere on earth not just in oroville and in the ashram everywhere on earth where we have individuals aspiring for the new consciousness aspiring to embody or to um, grow into it if we make this call and ask mother nature to help in that work we receive that help because she has agreed to collaborate separate from this where this contact can be so obvious and simple as asking separate from this there is the other action which we discussed where nature is working through the human mind to also push forward these interventions so this is where we will pause you can see he is going very deep into the whole mechanism of evolution some of it sounds repetitive 
because there are similar ideas we have faced before. But in consolidating the picture, of course there has to be a repetition, but in the act of consolidating he now points to finer nuances. All of these he will then draw into the picture of the next step. How these threads connect for that? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So the word soul and psychic being is distinguished in this way. The word soul is very loosely used. It is used to describe any center of consciousness of individuality. So Sri Aurobindo says the human being has three souls. There is the surface center of individuality, the desire soul, where we define ourselves in terms of our desires. If I ask you to introduce yourself, you will probably say something like, I am someone who likes this, who doesn't like that, who does this, doesn't do that. Your description of your personality is in terms of likes and dislikes, capacities and incapacities. This is the desire soul. Within that, deeper inside, is the inner soul. That is the part where you are conscious of yourself as a caring, loving, conscious being, perhaps with some kind of an aspiration to grow, to make the world better, to be nice to people and so on. And that is our good side, that's where we feel our conscience when we do something wrong. But behind that, not conscious to us, is a deeper center which is the true center and that is the true soul or the psychic being. He also uses the phrase inmost soul. So outer soul which is also desire soul, inner soul and then inmost soul which is the true soul and the psychic being. And that is the one who is consciously taken birth, who entered this body and who is from deep within drawing the nourishment of growth of life experience and who will carry it through lives. It is from there that this inner soul receives its qualities. It is because the inmost soul is present that in the inner soul you have a conscience or you have an aspiration or the turn to goodness and so on. And this is further covered up by the desire soul which clouds the inner soul. So as the desire soul becomes more clear, less egocentric, less desire based, the inner soul comes forward. But as the consciousness opens more deeply to the source of the aspiration and the psychic influence grows, the inmost soul and the true center of personality comes forward. Are you describing in Gita and yes. that, that inner soul or psychic being has a form? I mean in complex form or it grows? Uh, yes. In the Veda, this center is described as a growing consciousness, a growing flame or light. There is a description of a thumb-like form, but the idea of thumb is not shape of thumb, but like a size. But again, all of these are very superficial descriptions. When the surface mind looks at something which does not belong to its domain, it represents it to its conception in whatever it is familiar with. But when you actually enter the experience and enter directly in contact with the psychic being, the experience is vividly different. Mother even describes in one case the psychic being being larger than the physical body also. So at that point this thumb-like description fails completely. That's more the perception we have when we turn in, oh something small deep inside. But when we begin to live in it more and more, then it is something large, this is true, this is more real more complete. It has even a form. And again, depending on, on how one sees it, the form may represent in one of several ways. The form is not important. It is the substance and quality of consciousness of the psychic being that makes it what it is. So all of these, of course, belong to the growing experience. Yes. Yes. So the psychic being, the psychic being is growing the form is growing. So you have two evolutions. The inner consciousness grows, the form grows which can also hold this or express this. Now the inner consciousness may grow and your form or surface personality may have a very dull, limited, 
or clouded personality. If this personality became more clear and pure, then the inner consciousness could express more freely. But they are independent in evolution. If the outer consciousness became transparent, the inner could express freely, it could grow also more rapidly. So ideally, the two should be synchronized. The outer should be able to express the inner and the inner should lead. But sometimes the inner is constricted, it is bound and limited by the outer, it still grows. Always the drive of evolution is from inside. And it is from there that the influence also will come on the surface parts to change them most rapidly. Now your mind may grow rapidly, your form also eventually will grow. And this is the point we will see later. The push from the inner influence can actually lead to even physical changes and the change of form. So the driver of evolution we will see is always inside. But it can be from the inner action of the divine consciousness working overall in nature. So on a whole species to push it. Or it can also be in the individual consciousness, the individual soul pushing forward to grow rapidly. And so right now, we are at that phase in evolution where both are happening. Mother says, this is the time when nature has, is preparing for this great leap. So all around in the universal nature, there is this push forward. And if you can align yourself with that, you'll find a huge support for a rapid forward evolution. Afterwards, once that subsides, your individual evolutionary urge may be there, I, may, I want to grow, but I don't have the same support in nature. So this is that transitional period where everything is aligned. Not only nature is pushing, but from above there is the divine intervention to draw you. And if you are in, your individual aspiration aligns, you can do so much. That is why he calls it an hour of God. And when the divine presence is close, and in the hour of God, he says, even a little effort produces great results and changes destiny. And this is true not only of an individual level, but also at the species level. A little effort produces great results and changes destiny. So we are in the most precious period of human evolution. The, the concept is there, yes. They speak of it in terms of Agni. Agni growing within us. That's how they describe the psychic being. Mm 